Hello everybody, welcome to another episode of Tech Motoring. Today we're going to be discussing Tesla and where they're going. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Tech Motoring. I am Paul, as you know, and today I have a friend of mine named Chris. Chris is a Tesla owner himself, bought one exactly one year ago, this week. Um, we're going to kind of go over his experience as an owner of that car and go over some news in Tesla's world and see where they're coming from. So, Chris, thank you for joining me today. My pleasure. First things first, I mean, there's been a lot of news about Tesla all the time, really. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, it seems like every time you, you go through the news, you either see something about Tesla or Elon Musk because it's either he's blasting stuff into space or he's making cars drive by themselves. And that seems to be a pretty hot topic for a lot of reasons, you know. He's a bit of an attention hog. Yes, a, a bit, yes. So I think, you know, that being said, you know, we see a lot of news articles, some some negative but a lot of positive about what he's doing with you know not only you know vehicles in general the technology in those vehicles that that somehow makes these things drive by themselves which uh chris's tesla model 3 which we are doing a review on which you'll see shortly um that car with the autopilot has evolved so much over the past 12 months since you first bought it and it is amazing if you've never experienced being in a Tesla that drives itself, it is an amazing and slightly scary feeling at first. But once you get used to it, it's it's fantastic. Oh, definitely. And, uh, you know, you, you find yourself starting to, uh, to rely on it. And even uh, kicking in that autopilot on the, uh, the daily drive on the more boring bits. Yeah, and I, I can definitely see as that makes the, the daily drive a lot easier easier you know you can pretty much just get in your car in the morning and hit that button and kind of go and feel you know safe that the car is going to do a majority of the work i mean obviously you're always going to be attentive of what the car is doing but oh, yeah. you know knowing that the car is an extra barrier of that security that in the event that something was to happen the car will jump in and try to try to save you as well yeah that, uh, you know, it is the second set of eyes, uh, always watching and keeping an eye out because uh, I know I certainly get distracted uh, by weird things that happen uh, on the side of the road during the drive or uh, that uh, random chirp because the phone didn't go into uh, um, do not disturb mode. You know, it's, it's good to know that there's a uh, extra set of um, extra set of cameras keeping an eye on what's going on around you. Yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of times, you know, accidents happen because something will distract you from the right-hand side. You know, let's say it'd be, you know, a pedestrian about to jump across the road real quick and you, d you just see them out of the corner of your eye. So you go to worry about them not realizing that the car next to you is about to merge into you or about to pull out in front of you. And, and sometimes those are where accidents really happen is is not from the driver not paying attention but paying attention to something else and having a car that you know you see one object that's going to cause a problem but the car is already looking everywhere else exactly. you know so if a car jumps out in front of you it's going to slam on the brakes because it knows better mm -hmm. whereas you know you're worried about the pedestrian but the car is worried about everything so it's nice to have that extra bit of security there yeah, as a, as the human driver, I have, you know, my my perceptive field that only covers, you know, ninety plus degrees, whereas the the car's cameras and its processors are capable of picking up the full three hundred and sixty and uh, keeping an eye on all of those items at once. Yeah, I mean that's that's amazing, and and I have seen that like that is evident in the vehicle that we're driving, you know, your car. So I mean that's it's really cool to see that technology today um, not many car manufacturers have come that far with their and it doesn't have to be electric cars I mean this could be any type of vehicle with those safety features and Tesla not only started the electric 
car f what would you call that the electric car craze i guess you could kind of say it i mean i think electric cars have been out for a while but they've just never got a hold in the market like nobody ever really you know right. took to them well they they definitely brought it into the mainstream um before that, uh, hybrid cars and even some electric cars were very much a, uh, a hobbyist's field or a um, way to maintain um, government-mandated regulations. Um, and that's, that's kind of because of the, the momentum of the economy and the, um, the specific people that were pushing it focused on a very, very narrow uh, style of transportation. Um, back when electric car, or back when the idea of the automobile was first introduced, um, there was actually, you know, relative parity between um, electric vehicles, steam vehicles, mm -hmm. and gasoline vehicles. Right. And one uh, of the first vehicles ever made was electric. Yeah. And, so. and as uh, time went on and the Industrial Revolution continued and our, um, you know, U.S. Uh, gold boom or, or black <laughs> gold boom in right. this case, right. uh, it kind of directed the flow and the ebb of the technology in a certain direction, um, putting all electric vehicles in kind of a... Uh, you know, tinker, tinkerers or uh, inventors wheelhouse. And uh, what, what Tesla really did was uh, take a startup company that had the right financial backing, uh, i.e. Musk and, and his fortunes out of PayPal, yeah, right. and was able to basically build on um, the technology that had been uh, laid out by those tinkerers and build it into a, a production-ready system that is capable of meeting the mass market. And they did that through a very unique stair step of uh, different styles of vehicles. Correct. And I mean, I think the vehicles are more appealing than previous attempts by other car manufacturers. I mean, like, the, the big one is the, the Chevrolet EV1 that came out uh, about two decades ago that even though there was a cult following for the car, a lot of people loved the car, it just didn't appeal to the mass market because it was not practical. It was a two-seater vehicle that, you know, had very minimal range because it was one of the first electric cars. And, I mean, Chevrolet literally pulled the plug on it. Like, they just basically said, we're done with them and we're taking them all back. Um, basically grabbing them out of the hands of of lease of people who lease the cars and basically refused to give any back in any way shape or form you could not buy the cars you could not get them and you know that was like the first attempt that was a, f a failure in a way that the electric car just was not ready at that time mm -hmm. and you know give it 15 years later and here's elon musk that says well we're going to do something we're going to do it right and obviously there's a lot of doubters at that point because, you know, here's a guy, billionaire, says he's going to do something that has failed multiple times in the past. And I think what really helps Tesla is not the fact that they build the cars as so much as they build the infrastructure for the cars. The supercharging stations, I think, is what really got them off the ground. Right. And the supercharging stations is what started all the other electric car charging station companies to come in and start saying hey you know what you know we could do this too let's let's build infrastructures for the other electric cars out there so yeah i think elon had a lot to do with a lot of that but i think the infrastructure of the electric car charging mm -hmm. system i think was also a big part of that as well yeah because prior to that electric car you buy an electric car you charge it at home you really didn't have a choice per right. se um so i mean that was Obviously, you couldn't buy the car as your primary car because you couldn't travel very far, you know, and the cars were usually too small to be practical to go on long trips with a family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Elon basically walked in and said, here you go. Here's here's practicality and here's that range that you've been looking for. And, oh, yeah, by the way, you can just charge at one of these thousands of stations that we have spaced out perfectly for all of our vehicles to reach. 
Right. So, I mean, it didn't start out like that. The, no, it did the not. The supercharger network was still very much an idea when um, the roadsters were coming out. Correct. And it very much became a uh, uh, the phenomenon that it did when they were looking to release the um, Model S's. Right. Because um, the roadsters do use a different plug. Yeah. For their cars versus what we know today as the Tesla charging charging mm -hmm. port. So and uh, I mean, we also had some additional uh, foyers into the market with like the Nissan Leaf. Right. That uh, you know kind of kind of um, pre preceded some of the major hype around uh, Tesla and what it was doing. Right. But again, um, a lot of uh, along with the the network, the vehicles themselves, uh, Tesla also made some very um, bold steps in the battery market oh, in yes. terms of how they mm -hmm. they set up and prepared their batteries, such that still to this day, the longest range electric vehicles that you can buy commercially are Teslas. Correct, and we're actually going to get into that in a little later about the batteries and and where they're going with those too, because there is going to be a big announcement about that. And we'll, we'll go over all that in a little bit. Um, but let's start with some of the news that we've we've seen just recently in the past uh, few weeks. Now, obviously with COVID being as rampant as it is through the United States and the whole world, everybody has been struggling, uh, including car companies, just trying to sell their cars because it's hard to sell cars when people aren't working. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, seeing that, you know, Tesla, had their recent second quarter uh, results come out. And even though it was lower than they had initially anticipated, they weren't anticipating a, a pandemic. So so these numbers were a little lower by, by less than 5%. And this, this article we're reading off of TechCrunch um, that recently got these numbers that Tesla delivered over 90,000 vehicles in the second quarter, which is right when the pandemic basically hit the United States. Um, and then these numbers are, are worldwide for, for Tesla. So right. this is United States and, and for China. Mm -hmm. um, so seeing a number like that where the decline is so minimal, you know, that that is saying something for Tesla that, you know, there are people out there still willing, willing to invest into these vehicles and still willing to you know, buy them even during a pandemic like this. I mean, it's only it's only uh, amazing what would what we could have seen if they had if we didn't have a pandemic. How big their numbers could have been then. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested in the quarter three numbers. But w what do you think about you know that type of performance in in such a a poor economy to say to you know at this point? Well, I definitely think um, that the the kind of uh, tangential model that uh, Tesla has put together to sell their cars um, is is partly uh, a reason behind these numbers. Um, their their stores are obviously a lot different than um, than your modern dealership. There's uh, you know very very clear cut numbers around uh, how they do their sales, as well as uh, the fact that. You can order these vehicles online and right. never really have to be present and you can follow all um, World Health Organization and CDC or uh, uh, CDC rules around social distancing and still get a uh, excellent experience around a car delivery and a car purchase right um, I will also say that there's a chance that uh, a lot of these numbers were pre-orders. Correct. Such that Correct. Uh, these these orders that were being fulfilled now, especially for the uh, Model Y vehicles, were placed potentially year a year ago, yes. if not many months uh, ahead of time. Because um, a majority of the vehicles that were s delivered in quarter two were the Model 3 and the Model Y, which is the, the cheapest budget vehicle that they make not to say that they're a cheap vehicle but they are the cheapest vehicle you could purchase from tesla so obviously most popular right for that for that reason and and i will say uh when i um ordered my three 
there was probably only a two week gap between when I decided to make my purchase and when I uh, was driving away with my vehicle. Right. So they, they can provide a relatively quick turnaround. So I don't necessarily want to discount their, uh, their sales numbers uh, for this quarter, but there is a, a possibility that some of it happened um, before we got into the situation uh, we are now. Correct. And speaking of discount, uh, they did actually roll back some prices on um, some of their vehicles during that time as well. So, so there was a little bit more incentive for people because Tesla said, "Okay, we're gonna we're gonna drop the price in some of our vehicles." I think it was about a thousand dollars, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, but that was also a little bit of an incentive for people to kind of jump onto that bandwagon and say, "Hey, you know, now's as good of a time as any. I can order the car now. I'll, I'll get it eventually." You know, in the next few weeks or so. So yeah, definitely they could have had a lot of pre-orders, which I agree with you. The Y has been pre-orderable, I think, for like a year, maybe even longer than that. So a lot of people probably had that pre-order in there and, and had to pick the car up anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that definitely makes sense. So on another note, uh, the Tesla stock has actually been still going up. I mean, the stock market's had its ups and downs the last few months. Uh, for obvious reasons, and Tesla stock has still seen very positive days, positive weeks. I mean, they are now at their record high of twelve hundred dollars plus at the time of the recording this. I mean, that is that is amazing. Yeah. Um, it is. It was a stock that you know, you know, when we looked at this ten years ago, you know, back when you were talking about Teslas and how you wanted one. I mean that was that was a stock that was you know less than a hundred bucks a share or, or somewhere around that hundred dollars a share, you know if only <laughs> if only we had known slightly where where this was heading, man, you know we would be doing pretty well for ourselves right now. But but yeah, like it's it's at twelve hundred dollars a share. I mean that says something for for a company, you know, even especially a car company because car companies have have struggled so much in the past. You know, ten or fifteen years. I mean, look at the bailouts that happened with, you know, Ford and, and Chrysler and GM. Actually, Ford didn't really take the bailout; they were fairly safe, but they were still sitting next to Ford and Chrysler during those those times. But, but yeah, I mean, there was you know a point where car manufacturers were so hurting that they, you know, possibly weren't going to be there very long. And you know, thankfully now they, a lot of them have turned over, you know, that new leaf and have started to you know, gain that popularity back, building cars that are a little bit more, uh, in my opinion, a little bit more reliable. Because uh, I think there was a reliability issue with a lot of vehicles back in the like, early 2000s where, you know, people were buying them and having a lot of issues with them in the first, you know, 100,000 miles. And a lot of people, I think, turned to uh, Japanese vehicles at that point. They were going to Toyotas and the Nissans and the Hondas and, and even Hyundai. Like, with the stock being at you know, over twelve hundred dollars a share. You know, what does that mean for Tesla? Does this does this mean that their twelve hundred dollars a share is an accurate number? Do we feel like this is just a, a hype factor that you know so many people are buying the cars and and they're buying their stocks and you know there's a lot of investors out there. Like, you know, what what do you think is the the reason for such a high stock price here? Well. Um... Definitely believe that, that Tesla is providing a lot of good inter innovation in the market right now. They definitely appear to be uh, market leaders with um, autonomous vehicles and also in electric vehicles. Uh, there are definitely other startups that are uh, looking to compete with them and going off of the same uh, startup base with the idea of custom technology that they then build up the production capabilities of whereas you know more your more uh, established companies like your Fords and Chryslers have that um, installation and uh, production base already established but run into the problem of having a lot of difficulty um, tailoring their already existing processes that they've invested a lot into into these new technology fields. Um, and generally, uh, I think that the stock price is a good indicator that a lot of people either A, really want to see the technology succeed, 
or B, really believe in the um, philosophy and management style and that the company will continue to innovate in unique and disruptive uh, directions that have already given the company as much success as it has. Right, right. And, you know, let me ask you this. So now you brought up about how, you know, most car companies like Ford and GM and stuff are, have been established and have been established for, for years and years and years and years. And, you know, they're not really in the field of expanding their physical footprint because they're already there. Whereas Tesla being kind of the newcomer, they're always announcing new gigafactory here, new gigafactory there, you know, we're, we're developing this, we're developing that. Whereas, you know, the bigger GM, Fords, Chryslers, you know, Toyotas, they've already had that established for, for decades in a lot of these oh, yeah. countries. So, so maybe that hype that Elon is bringing to everybody is, is oh yeah, we're, we're expanding here, we're expanding there, we're expanding there. And people are seeing that and are going, oh, 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 oh we're, they're, they're, they're getting big, they got a lot of money, you know, they're, they're growing at such a rapid pace, you know. This is probably the same feeling that people had back in the, the 50s when, you know, GM and Ford were, were coming out of Detroit and they're, they were expanding and their cars were getting shipped all over the United States and people were buying them and it seemed like maybe that's that same feeling. But we're seeing it in such a dynamic way that, you know, now that we're such a, you know, a connected globe, where everybody across the world is connected so easily now that, you know, to ship a car across the, the sea is, is just do it. Look, there it goes. And, oh. and it's so easy now, whereas, you know, GM and Ford and those, they had this, you know, they had to basically build that. They had mm -hmm. to make sure that that was even a thing, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago to, to get their cars to Europe, to get their cars to China and Japan and to make that a possibility and then once that was established then they built those factories overseas to to help with that population and you know to build the cars locally for them so so yeah I, I mean I think that maybe has part of it as well it's just the fact that you know the the news comes out and because it can be sent across the globe so easily now between you know social media and just the internet in general I think maybe that is giving the extra hype to Tesla at this point oh, yeah. for why their stock is doing so well. Um, I definitely think a lot of it has to do with the media cycle. Um, you know, a, a new Toyota or Ford plant comes online and at best it makes local news. Yes, yes. Um, with, uh, you know, with Tesla and just the, the level of... Um, the level of news cycle that they've been able to hold on to, it really means that you know when um, a new gigafactory is proposed, you hear about the three different states that are uh, competing to get it to come to their location. Right. Mm -hmm. um, just like any other, or just like any company's um, major headquarters being relo relocated to a uh, location. Um, we've seen that hit the news cycle in the past, um, and the the uh, different areas uh, vying for um, the honor and prestige. Yes, and, and we potential tax incomes. And, and we yeah, <laughs> and we've seen this with Amazon as well. You yes. know, Amazon says we're building a new headquarters, and it seems like every single state is raising their hands, going "Ooh me, ooh me." Because they know what that brings to the state. It brings a lot of money. It brings a lot of jobs. And mm -hmm. yes, Amazon gets those tax breaks as well because that's how these states have to fight to get them into that state. Because Amazon, the juggernaut that they are, they build one giant warehouse or, or one big headquarters, and that could be thousands or tens of thousands of jobs. So, you know, obviously every state wants their, their piece of that, you know, they want to yeah. have that, you know, and, and Tesla does the same thing every time they say, hey, we want a, a new plant here, you know, all of a sudden rumors, speculation, everything comes out of the woodwork and basically, you know, it's, oh, it's going to be here, it's going to be there, it's going to be there, and, you know, and, and, and we were just reading an article about they're looking to, to open up a, a plant in Austin, I believe it was, and even though this has been news for a while, 
there has been no official announcement that that's the thing, but like people are still very, very convinced that Austin is their next, you know, grounds for for their factory. We really don't know if that is true or not, but right. but that hype, that hype is really all it takes. And a lot of that is can be directly related to um, the particular CEO that spends a lot of time on Twitter. True. Moving on to. The next thing, which is not really a news article, it's more of like a mystery at this point. So, so Battery Day was supposed to happen yeah. back in, I think it was uh, it was April or May or something. It was somewhere around that time. Obviously, with recent events, that has now been postponed. Um, I think they said September at this point was, I think, the Battery Day announcement. Now, obviously, there's always always rumors and speculation as to what Battery Day is going to bring. So, we've heard the rumors of the Million Mile Battery basically stating that the battery will last a million miles of charging and discharging over the course of the, the vehicle's life without any severe degradation to that battery. Whereas typical lithium-ion cells now, you know, they have a charge rate of, you know, well, I mean, if you take a phone, for instance, I think they estimate like between, you know, one to 2,000 full charges before the battery is no longer you know, at its full capacity. It's below like an 80% capacity at that point. Um, and they're, they're, they consider it to be a degraded battery. So, right. so what basically Tesla is saying or what they're, or well, they haven't stated it yet, but mm -hmm. the rumor behind it is that they're gonna develop this battery that can withstand those consistent charges and discharges over the course of years and years and years where that battery will perform to a specific standard without any severe degradation, which means you could buy a car and the mileage that they're expecting out of it as well. So with this million mile battery, you know, a car like yours with the ex uh, standard plus model, you know, 250 miles, you know, they're talking that this could potentially give you three, three to 400 miles, let's say, on that same platform mm -hmm. on that vehicle. And, you know, we see that with the Cybertruck where they're, they're announcing that the Cybertruck is going to get, you know, 600 and something miles on a charge. And, you know, if you get the highest model, the tri-motor, I believe it is. And, you know, we don't know if the Cybertruck is that new battery technology. Like, we don't know that yet. It's not coming out for another year. So maybe yeah. that's what they're speculating, or maybe it's just a big battery. It's hard to say at this point, because they haven't released those. Right. Definitely could be both. It, it definitely could be. You know, I mean, and, you know, it would be weird for them to announce a vehicle with these specifications before they knew they could do it. So, so either this has been a secret for a while with Tesla, or, you know, they're just making up a battery number because they could shove a battery big enough with the current you know, the current technology that they put in their normal cars. So so right. we don't really know where that's going right now, which I think is I think is interesting because, you know, I think everybody wants to know what battery day is going to bring. Well, you have to understand that um, battery technology is is definitely a major area of study for a lot of the academic world because it's so heavily integrated into just about everything we do there's a high probability that everybody watching this is using some type of battery-enabled uh, device. Even ones that you wouldn't really think about, if it was on a standard uh, TV or a uh, um, PC, there's still batteries in there. Right. And capacitors, which arguably are, you know, nearby cousins of batteries yes. uh, just designed in slightly different ways. Uh, so the academic world is very interested in um, battery technology and the batteries that we use now, the lithium ions, um, are the best battery that we have found to mass produce. But there are theoretically so many other chemistries and materials that can be used and some that even promise some incredible performances. Right. The challenge is scaling those concepts out of the lab and into a full-blown manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, system. 
and Tesla has made some acquisitions of other companies right. that are heavily speculated in the uh, battery day um, rumor mill, so to speak. Right. Uh, that are working on some on that scale up of some very impressive technology, including some of the um, like holy grail esque items of solid state batteries right which has and, been a rumor for a while with tesla specifically right and and things like um you know graphene doping batteries and some other like very very rare technologies that potentially offer incredible performance jumps and life jumps like the the million mile uh battery which i super hate that everyone calls it the million mile net battery because that first glance it's like oh it's gonna go for a million miles. yeah yeah well, people somehow ultimately <laughs> think that it's gonna be a million mile distance battery which that's yeah. that's not the case it's just the lifespan of the battery so yeah that is a good thing i hope they point out more clearly during the announcement that this is not designed to go a million miles and right. recharge uh battery technology is not quite there yet um, and, and generally it's um like the the mile is kind of the major disnomer there because it's uh, it's generally noted noted in number of cycles. Right. Correct. Of charge and discharge for the batteries. Yeah. Yeah. So. It would make more sense if they said this is the hundred thousand cycle battery right. or something like that. That would make more you know sense in when you think oh I can charge it a hundred thousand times you know versus it goes a million miles. Well, yeah, but that that means it's a yeah. life cycle, not necessarily a. And it doesn't. The, the the cycle count doesn't really uh, capture the uh, the the starry eyed uh, news headlines. Exactly, so. exactly. Plus, cycle counts are a little weird because you know every company considers a cycle count to be different. Some count it as from a hundred percent to to twenty percent. Some count it from you know eighty percent to thirty percent. Like everybody kind of changes their definition of what a cycle count is so I, yeah i think that can be a little bit you know harder for people to grasp you know in in the normal you know everyday discussion is oh yeah well yeah the car could do a hundred thousand cycles that means nothing to a lot of people but when you say it could do a million miles then a lot of people think oh yeah that's that's interesting a million miles that's a lot of miles it's a yeah. million you know so it's it's all yes yeah, on the odometer not necessarily on that one tank of fuel in, in, in that regard. Um, so so bringing that up, the million mile battery. So they're talking about a battery that's going to basically outlast the physical car practically at that point. You know, I mean, it, if you've ever seen a car with a million miles on it, which they are cars out there with a million miles on it, yeah. obviously over the course of their life, they have replaced pretty much every single part on that car multiple times. You know, mm -hmm. that car is pretty much no longer itself. Uh, so, so that's a fun philosophical question that we get into. <laughs> is it itself? It's really hard to say at that point because <laughs> when you've changed every piece out of that car except for maybe the body, um, is it still the same car? It's it's kind of hard to say at that point. Yeah. Because um, let's face it, transmissions don't last a million miles. Internal combustion engines don't last a million miles. Uh, you know, a lot of times you need to either get the the block re redone at one point or you know every the transmission's got to be rebuilt or replaced like it's never the same car after mm -hmm. a million miles so when they say a million mile battery i mean they're basically saying that that vin number yeah. <laughs> should survive a, a million miles with that one physical battery in that car yeah. um now that being said depending on how long it takes somebody to drive a million miles you know for some people that's you know 10 years some people that's a whole lifetime Right. You know, some people don't drive as much as others. And, you know, Elon and Tesla have, a, once again, another rumor, because nothing is, is ever set in stone until Elon stands up in front of everybody and says, this is what we're doing. And then it's still a little shaky. And then it's still a little shaky <laughs> until the release, yeah. Um, but, but give or take, it's, it's still, he's still very good at, you know, bringing it to market. 99% of what he announces so he's pretty oh, yeah. good at that there is Elon time though yes and yeah yeah <laughs> one year usually means 
18 to 24 months, but <laughs> but that's okay as long as it's right when it comes out. Exactly. But so he so there's speculation of of the million mile battery not necessarily being used just as a battery for your vehicle, but as a battery for your your use, your everyday use, your your house per mm -hmm. se. So so if you think of it this way, picture your vehicle being a power source for your house. Yeah. Which is possible. And if you're not familiar with the power wall that Tesla offers, that is a battery backup system, or I should just say a battery system for your house, not really a backup system. It could yeah. just be used every day if you wanted it to. A battery for your house that powers your entire house for, you know, hours depending on your, your usage. Right. Um, that can sustain your lifestyle, you know, all day long or over the night, depending on what you use it for. Typically, you use a power wall in conjunction with solar. Right. So during the day, your solar power were, would fill your batteries. Mm -hmm. And then at nighttime, when the solar is no longer there, your batteries would take over and give you power throughout the night. Theoretically, taking you off the grid if you wanted to, but possible. taking a chance based on weather patterns and where you live and how much solar panels you have and how much power you produce. Obviously, if you can never fill the batteries on a daily basis, eventually you're going to run out and then you're going to be just out of electricity unless you have a week where you just say no to electricity. But, you know, that's... I mean, usage very much varies on the um, environment and the season and a number yes. of, uh, you know, different factors... And um, obviously, it's a it's a scalable system, so right. You can have multiple batteries, right? And you can put on mul or more solar if you need to. Exactly, exactly. Um, so as so, your as your family grows, right? Or as your electric car family grows, you may need that extra power, so you can charge your vehicles and or use more electronics in your house. So yeah, so that is always a scalable yeah a scalable solution to that. So what we were getting at was, you know, imagine instead of having this power wall in your house, your Tesla vehicle becomes your power wall in a sense. So you come home and you plug your vehicle in like you normally would. And, you know, if at nighttime, let's say you want to not use the grid power, you know, depending on where you live, your, your kilowatt usage may be expensive during certain times of the day, or, you know, when you're on peak hours or off peak hours, depending on where you live, it's all different. So, you know, maybe there's a weekend or just every night or however you want to do it, you plug your car in and the car feeds back into your house. Mm -hmm. Therefore, once again, pulling you off the grid for that moment and giving you that extra power without having to pay an electric, uh, electrical utility company yeah. for that instead. Um, so, so what is your thoughts on this as, as a rumor that is possible? From um, so, uh, there, there have been additional rumors. I, I haven't looked into them specifically that, uh, some of this technology is already being identified inside, uh, current vehicles that Tesla has released, including some of the, uh, the Model 3s and Model Ys, um, that these... Uh, have the capability to provide energy back into the uh, the home. Um, there's there's also a a secondary step that you can take with this technology, and that is um, as a grid system beyond the the individual homeowner um, to the point where you could be selling some of that energy that you've stored uh, in the battery of the car or the battery of the power wall back to the utility that will um, specifically request it and hopefully offer a premium price for it uh, as an alternative to peaker plants, which are um, specific power plants that are designed to uh, come up to operation quickly and provide energy during very high uh, demand points throughout the day. Right. 
middle of the summer, it's hot, everybody's running their air conditioning, right. you just plug your car in and it will pull from your car. And, and like you were saying, if it demands it and your car is plugged in and it sends it back, you could technically make money off of this. And I think Elon has got a good idea here where, if this is his idea, why not buy a Tesla that could potentially make you money if you have that right scenario where, you know, you have the ability to keep your car plugged in and, you know, during those peak hours, yeah. you know, you have the ability to, to sell back. So I think this is, this could be a huge, a huge thing. And it also could, you know, decrease the price of a vehicle because if you think about it, you know, let's say you buy a car, you know, based on a contract that you're going to sell back so much electricity per year, you know, almost like a lease in a way where instead of it being like a mileage restriction, you have to sell back so much power from your car every year and you can get a discount off the car. Because hmm. if Tesla, let's say you're selling power back and Tesla makes, I don't know, let's just say $10,000 off of that electricity that you've sold back over the course of a year at peak time, maybe they give you a discount off the car, five, $6,000. So Tesla makes money on the back end and you get a car cheaper than the sticker price. Yeah. So that's a possibility as well. So, you know, when you think about it, it's it's much bigger than just you could sell it back and get a little check in the mail every month. Like maybe it's something right off the bat, you buy a car and, you know, here, here's a contract. Yeah. You need to sell this much electricity back and we'll give you this much off your car. Right. And, you know, that could be another way of... of you know, getting people into these Teslas. And obviously, the more Teslas you have on the road, the bigger the infrastructure. Exactly. The, the bigger the infrastructure, the less we're dependent on these electric companies for this power. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is a big thing because we are really rolling into, you know, renewable energy at this point. You know, whether it be solar power, which is obviously a big thing right now, uh, you know, wind power with you know, those big windmills that are out in the middle of the Midwest that are producing a lot of power for people. And, you know, we also have the tidal power as well, where it comes in with the ocean currents and, and the waves. So, I mean, there's so many ideas out there that could potentially be, you know, used to produce power versus, you know, coal factories or even, you know, nuclear power plants. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what's, what do you think of, like, going to a system where our cars are powering, you know, our homes and, and our towns, basically, versus relying so much on, you know, our coal or power plants or, or nuclear power plants. Well, um, I definitely think that it's a good possibility and uh, potentially a, a major part of our future. But remember that the vehicles don't generate any electricity. Right. Um, will still need to make that energy, be it through a new renewable mm -hmm. or through a uh, um, burning a dinosaur. Method, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, uh, but at, uh, at the end of the day, however we um, uh, generate that energy, the more consistently we can generate that energy, the, the less waste we'll have in generating it. Correct. Um, a, a coal power plant that runs 24-7 is a lot more efficient and, um, you know, uh, better at not necessarily carbon emissions, but other harmful emissions than, say, a um, diesel generator peaker plant would be. Right. So even getting away from those uh, pulse need... Uh, power plants is going to have a positive uh, benefit on the environment whether we shift away from uh, fossil fuels as a general production method and uh, in batter or energy storage um, on this uh, massive scale is something that's you know been heavily researched lately um, talking about uh, gravity batteries or flow batteries or um, 
uh, hydro pumping plants that uh, move water around to store it as potential energy. Right. Um, having that uh, secondary use of um, lithium ion cells that we are also using as our transportation method is a excellent um, disruptive divergence of and or, or convergence of two technologies that will hopefully make our world a better place. Right. And I mean, I think that's what we have to really look into and, and look forward to really is, is, you know, the more renewable resources we implement into this world, the less harmful, you know, things we're going to do to it. You know, we are going to produce electricity, you know, without any emissions from it. And I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, we can store this renewable energy. Because you and however many other people are providing this solar energy option and the potential to refeed it back into the grid, if, if that's there enough, that means that not only, or you may still need your peaker plant, but maybe you run the larger plant at half capacity right. because it's being replaced by people feeding back from their local solar. Right. Major issue with having large solar farms is that it takes up a heck of a lot of real lot estate. Of space, yeah. You know, if everybody takes up a little real estate instead, mm -hmm. you know, you, uh, you can build a large system from many small systems. Right. And I mean, one example of that is California, where yeah. right now, all new construction of houses have to have a solar array of some sort, hmm. which, which I thought was amazing. Like, that's a big step. Yeah. That's a huge step. I mean, that means that when you're buying a house, you're putting a fifteen or $20,000, you know, solar system mandatory like it has to be done like that's yeah. that's a big step i think and and i'm not saying that has to be done in every state i'm not saying that's something that needs to be done uh california is one of those states that they get so much sunshine that it makes sense because right. they can produce a lot more whereas some states you know maybe like washington state or you know the dakotas probably don't get as much sunlight so maybe it wouldn't make as much sense up there they would be probably more beneficial to either like a wind type of turbine on a windmill versus versus solar but and very situational it, exactly <laughs> exactly in every way every way it's different so i mean i think that that's a big you know a big push nowadays as well as you know we need to see this kind of keep going in this direction and you know for everybody out there i will have a video out about my solar panel install that has recently been done i'll have a video on that and eventually i'll have videos on the cost of it and exactly what you're expecting to see over the course of that, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 years of owning that system. So we're going to go over all that and maybe solar is right for you. And that's something that you have to figure out with your local companies and your local solar companies and see if it works for you in your state or your county based on, you know, tax incentives and such. So we're going to go over a lot of that in the future. Tesla is... Uh, being able to generate you income right by being an owner right this is a concept that um, Elon has mentioned before absolutely to yes. to the point that um, he intended at least I don't know if it's still on the uh, the thought map that is Tesla um, that the autonomous vehicle systems inside it would eventually allow you to uh, rent your car out as part of a rideshare system mm -hmm. and that you would get a uh, potentially a check from uh, Tesla or the the orchestrating organization that is using your autonomous vehicle as a uh, rideshare platform and then you know your car would be making you money just by being the owner of it and that's kind of cool when you think about that if you could drive your car to work walk and, into your building right, watch it drive off your car takes off because it's got a pickup downstairs and then it takes it and and drops somebody off and you're making money working and your car is working for you like that's that i think is fantastic obviously we got to like get the 
charging situation fixed there because right now the cars can't disconnect themselves. And I know there has been, once again, rumors that they are working on a self-charging system where the car will back into a spot and the charger will kind of come out from an arm and then plug itself in. And I know they're discussing that with the Tesla semi trucks, mm -hmm. where basically, you know, a, a truck driver would basically pull in and the, you know, the mechanism would swing out and plug itself into the truck to charge it overnight. Um, and I thought another thing that was really cool about the Tesla semis is that they're talking about this autonomous version where you would basically have a driver in the lead semi truck driving and there would be two or three semis behind it that are autonomous and its goal is basically to stay behind the lead truck and that truck stays behind that truck and, and so on and so forth and I think that's really cool I mean you can imagine having these four tractor trailers rolling down the road with only one driver in it mm -hmm. like that's that's something that is is really interesting and I mean they just you have four semis pulling up into a truck stop all going to this charging station and all of a sudden you just have like a bunch of chargers coming out plugging in and you know an hour or two later they're back on the road and and heading down the highway with one driver so yeah that's something we could discuss in a later episode just to kind of see where that goes because the tesla semi is still kind of a, a mystery as well i mean they've Very announced it so. they've showed it they have you know the two different models that they show the smaller and the bigger one and and they have the speculated range on those and you know that's going to be a, a game changer mm -hmm. in this country and, and other countries when they do that so i think that's something that we can discuss in a future yeah. future episode about where those are going soon because that's going to be a big thing for tesla is if they can pull this off they've completely changed the trucking industry as we know it uh, another fun one on the uh, um, the non-interactive charging. Um, there is a a company out there not related to Tesla mm -hmm. that has set up a um, relatively easy to install um, set of uh, induction based mats. Okay. So you install it on the bottom mm -hmm. of the electric vehicle. And then you have a little hockey puck in the center of the garage mm -hmm. that's hooked up to the charger. And uh, I don't know a lot about the specific um, the specific technology. I, I read the article some months ago. But uh, <laughs> um, effectively, if you park within a you know, certain range of the puck on the bottom with very low loss, it will transmit and charge the vehicle, um, almost with with you know, maybe only like a two to five percent energy loss. Right, right. Um, and you know, you there's it's a non-contact charging method. Exactly. So no human intervention required if the vehicle is capable of parking itself correctly. Exactly. And I mean, you may recognize that technology with our cell phones nowadays with QI charging. Exactly. You, know, you put it on the mat, it starts charging, it's wireless. Um, and, and like you said, minimal loss, obviously on a greater scale this would be, but I mean, that would be, that would be impressive. And I know they've also had rumored about roads and highways having that technology as well, where your car would technically charge itself as it's going down a road. Um, which I think is way off in the future at this point. That yeah. seems to be, I mean, that's like changing the entire road infrastructure of the right. country. The, at that the point. level of infrastructure that that requires right. is immense. Right. And I don't particularly feel it's practical. No. From that perspective. <laughs> Definitely but. not. I don't. I don't see that being necessary at this point. I think. Yeah. I think trying to put all our effort into making cars charge faster and going longer range is really what people are interested in you know I, I don't even think the range is really necessary and and you know on that point it actually does you know when you think about it i mean most you know internal combustion engine cars i mean like my vehicle you know i get maybe with a, a mixture of city and highway i get about 300 to 3 and 325 miles on a tank of gas you know and that te that costs me roughly 20 bucks yeah. and i mean you could get a tesla model 3 extended range that that gets you about that same amount about three quarter three three fifty or so so when you think about it 
the range is really not going to be an issue much longer. I think a lot of people, that range anxiety, as they kind of discuss it with, is, is you yeah. know, am I going to make it? I think the infrastructure of charging vehicles has to be a little bit better because even though you might have greater range, there might be still a range anxiety of, oh, I missed that charger, but the next charger is 100 miles down the road or 50 miles down the road, and it says I only have 25 miles left. You know, I mean, you have to make a U-turn yeah. and go back. Whereas if you miss the gas station, typically you get another gas station a few miles up the road, right? and there's three of them. You know, so, I mean, I think that that also is, um, you know, a big thing right now is, is building the infrastructure of the car charging. So I, I agree with you, but... Um, the the question I want to ask is how often do you fill up your car? How often do I fill my car? It, that's exactly right. For me, that that gas will probably last me about uh, two weeks. Yeah, depending on you know certain circumstances. Right. So yeah. So and, absolutely. Right. And um, granted, I know that I have a very short commute to work, mm -hmm. but even with that, if you if you kept a large gas tank in your garage mm -hmm. and filled up your car every night you really wouldn't need that big of a tank in your vehicle you could shrink that down a lot more right because within your average driving day you know you maybe what 30 miles tops yeah give or take I mean, that's no. about it. I mean, and that, that makes a good point, is the fact that uh, you basically come home every day and refuel your vehicle. Right. And I actually mentioned that on, on one of my uh, previous videos about how just imagine you coming home to your house with your electric car, plugging it in, and not costing you anything because of your, your solar panels. You know, like that's, that's a future that people can look forward to. You never have to pay for fuel again, basically. And I mean the fact that you never have to go out of your way to a gas station to ever fuel again. I mean that's that's right. That's also an incentive as well to look into electric cars. And and granted, I've also been in the position where um, charging every night isn't necessarily feasible. Right. You know, uh, I I lived in an apartment that didn't have a good way to charge the vehicle on a regular basis, so. I, I played off the gas model and I went to a supercharger on a regular basis. So I think even as they are now, the cars are very much capable of playing at or playing in the same pond that uh, um, the current internal combustion engines play in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what needs to be there and, and you're totally right the infrastructure still isn't as vast as the uh, infrastructure is for internal combustion engines right but it's not stopping right so it's it's not uh not stopping and arguably if you look beyond the uh tesla network the supercharger network mm -hmm. and look into um the charge point network and uh, Chatamo is another yeah, one. Yeah, Chatamo and, and the general like just destination uh, chargers or um, you know Charge Plus. Like there are, there's actually a pretty big network available. Right. right. It's not just what you see on your Tesla screen. That's <laughs> just superchargers. But out there, there are a lot of other companies that are doing what Tesla is doing. Just. Mm -hmm on a scale that's more compatible with a lot of other cars. Yeah. Because a lot of them are going with the... Uh, the a lot of them are free, even. And, and that's another thing, too, is, is, you know, we even saw that last year when we came. When you came here, you bought the car, you had it for one week, and, you know, we only have one supercharger for about 50 miles. Like, we only have one supercharger in this area. So we actually went to... The outlets which had a charging station and when we backed into the charger we kind of stared at it for a second because you were new at the thing and I've never even seen an electric car before really and you know we kind of stared at it and went I guess it's free and then you plugged in and sure enough it charged your car with no cost and you know that's that's a benefit too I mean I hope that model stays I hope they don't do away with that in the future you know because you know I think 
economics will fight in the face of that a little. But. And I'm afraid of that as well. I think that that's a good possibility. But, you know, especially if you get early into this game of, of an electric car, you know, take advantage of it. You know, mm-hmm. use it now while you have it because it's, it's, it's out there. Oh, yeah. And the networks are there. And, and if you have a Tesla, yeah, you need an adapter for those other plugs. But um, it comes with the car. It does come with the vehicle as of a year ago. And when you bought yours, it does. You know, it might be different now or in the future. But right Very now or, or a year ago, it's it was available for for that car. So, so yeah, Tesla's aware that they're not the only, you know, they're not the only people out there. Mm-hmm. They know that there's other charging. And they're not fighting them in any way. They're not saying... Yeah we're going to be the best one. I mean, for one thing, superchargers don't work on any other cars. Right. They're just for Tesla. And, you know, they've already talked about they're going to open up that system for other cars, you know, where, you know, you buy an adapter from the Tesla supercharger to your car and it would still work. And and I think that would be a big move for Tesla because then they could just make more money yeah. by charging other vehicle car, you know, other vehicles that are electric to charge. There is an infrastructure is, problem there, though. Well, explain. Uh, so, when I plug into a supercharger, um, it identifies my car. Correct. And um, the interface that tells me how much I'm being charged and what an idle fee will be on that supercharger is all displayed on the internal screen. Correct. And if, uh, if I were to have a Chevy Volt... Mm-hmm. and went up to that system uh, with an adapter, that adapter might need to have a screen on it or there would need to be some additional kiosk put in at the supercharger to allow me to appropriately communicate with the supercharger and get um, give, give Tesla their money. Yeah, and I think that could be done in a different way, though. I mean, you could just have an app, or they build it into a Tesla app, where you basically back into a spot, you say, I'm at stall, you know, 2B, and you plug in your car, and then it just knows that that's your car at 2B, because you told it was in the app, and mm-hmm. knows what car you're driving. And, you know, so that could be done just by software. Yeah. So, yeah, the infrastructure maybe doesn't have to be physical in that point. It just has to be right. software-related. And, you know, and, and on an opposite note of that, there's been talks about trying to get that same system from those other charging stations as well, where you plug in from your charging station, like whether it be a Chatamo or, or charge charge point, and you plug in from there, and it recognizes your car through that, that charge point network or... And it will just charge you based through your yeah. Tesla account. Now that type of infrastructure is being supposedly worked on. That's what okay. That's what they're saying. So you know, if if these companies work very closely with Tesla, you know, we may have a solution in the future where you go to one of these other companies and there's a Tesla charger in in the the charging stall. Obviously, they've grown a lot. They've come a long way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a lot to, growing to be had at this point. I, mean, oh, yeah. I think we have, not only do we have a, a solid company, we have a solid vehicle, we have a solid infrastructure that is continuously growing. Uh, Tesla has proven to be a juggernaut in not only the, the motor vehicle category, but also the electric category. I mean, you have a company... Who does only electric vehicles? Well, Tesla is not a motor vehicle company. They're an energy company. They've specifically said that. True as well. They basically have a bunch of power plants on wheels driving around. Right? Well, not power plants, but power storage. (laughs) Power sources. Power storage, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. But they also have these um, you know, these power distribution sites that are the superchargers. Yep. And uh, they have the um, home storage options yeah, in the wall. The and power, the Tesla solar panels, right. the, and yeah. the solar. They are an energy company. Yeah. that happens to make a car. They've done so much in you know, let's call it fifteen years, where they've grown in in many categories. And we haven't even touched on the fact that they blast things into outer space all the time. Wow, <laughs> I mean that's not Different Tesla, company. but. 
Yeah, that's Elon, though. I mean, that's 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 there's a lot of crossover. I mean, and of course he he also has the Boring Company. That too. Which I mean, that that alone is you know something that. You know, you got to give him credit for it because that he literally calls it the boring company because it it's does probably it, the least interesting, the least interesting of the companies that yeah. he actively runs. And when that actually becomes a thing, when that actually blows up, like it will, um, that's going to be a big thing as well. I mean, I think you know, transportation mm -hmm. in in the way that he is is projecting, I think is is going to be uh, astounding. He does have a vision that that. I think a lot of people can't quite grasp. <laughs> I mean, we've we've seen it with the way certain people react to your car. You know, when they see it and they get into it for the first time, and you say, "Watch this," and you put the thing on autopilot. And I think the 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 reaction is is priceless. I mean, it was for me when I first did it. I mean, when I first drove the car and I put that thing on autopilot, I was like, "This is amazing. This is something that." You can't you can't imagine until you've experienced it. I really believe that that's the case. You know, it's yeah. You know, you, I I can compare it to like a roller coaster where you know you could see it, you know where it's going, you know where it's, but you don't know it really until you've been on it and and felt it and and experienced that, you know, situation for yourself. So yeah. I really feel like that. You know, a lot of people. The more people that see these cars, drive these cars. Uh, experience what they're capable of I think it's it's gonna keep blowing up it's gonna keep getting bigger as as he intends it to right I think a lot of that comes down to the fact that um, you know what it's doing is such a, a common part of our lives right and you know something that you you do every day right and you know now now it's not there. It's not something that you have to do anymore. Right. Right. No reason to go to a gas station anymore. Because you go home and you plug in, you're done. And, you know, that's that's something that, you know, we will all we will all have to do eventually. You know, a lot of a lot of countries are already putting in the books, you know, by twenty thirty, by twenty forty, by twenty fifty. You know, every vehicle being sold will be electric. They are just, they are all for it. They yeah. are jumping in both feet. They're putting it in law that this is the way that we are going to move. And I think that is necessary, mainly because of the fact that our fossil fuels are not going to last much longer. And, you know, we have, you know, it's finite, clearly. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's only so many dinosaurs. Right. So therefore, we only have so much fuel out there. And as much as we struggled to design, you know, hydrogen-powered cars, you know, we even tried the whole ethanol thing for a while there, where, you know, we, we tried building flex-fuel vehicles to run on that ethanol and gasoline, or just straight ethanol. And, you know, that obviously didn't work. I mean, it was almost like they released it, and the ethanol was... As expensive <laughs> than gas was, and people just weren't jumping on on that that ship. Yeah. Well, I I is that a a product of the economics of the time, or is that a product of the engineering and the demand? Right. Because if you don't if you don't sell enough vehicles that run on ethanol, then you're not going to sell as much ethanol, and you're not going to produce as much ethanol, and therefore you're just going to not make any money off it so you're just going to sell it at a premium because it's a supply and demand and when there's no demand no really reason to make a supply for it so so yeah i mean i think we've tried a lot of different things um that that obviously have not worked out for us mm -hmm. so i think renewable energy is the future it's the way we need to go it's the way we need to uh, for one thing save save this world yeah. You know, we're not going to Mars tomorrow, even though Elon's trying. Yeah. You know, but, you know, wow. we're all not going to have a moon place. First. Yeah, we'll start with the moon. <laughs> we're already there, but we're going back. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, we need to do something here first before we can just say, let's just, let's just take a rocket to Mars and, and call it our new home. So, I mean, we really need to, 
Yeah, there's there's a lot that um, hopefully we'll be doing in the future to uh, stabilize our current environment and hence learn how to better better modify other environments to suit our needs right and um a lot of that starts here but at the same time trying to do it other places will help to inform how we can do it here as well of course but that's a it's a completely different show that's another episode (laughs) and on that note i think we're pretty much done here Okay. Uh, once again, thank you, Chris, for, for joining me on this discussion. Uh, stay tuned for his review, his car review, for his 2019 Tesla Model 3. Um, we'll be doing another episode on that so you can see the car for yourself and see everything that it is capable of. We'll be doing that, that whole review on that car soon. Um, thank you again for watching. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment. And don't forget, welcome to the future and welcome to Tech Motoring. Thank you.